Welcome back to the channel guys. I am Dr. Dawson and today we're going to talk about E. caniculi. It has almost a mysterious feel to it, a mystical feel of this could be next, this could be known. So in today's video, we're really gonna tackle what is E. caniculi, how is it spread, how do we diagnose it, and how do we treat it? And here's everything you guys need to know, and we'll maybe even debunk a few myths here as well. So stick around till the end of the video. So E. caniculi has actually been found in some studies to be as prevalent as 40 to 80% of rabbits, depending on the study. So that means that in house rabbits across the country, 40 to 80% of them somewhere in there, so a large percentage either way, have been exposed to this disease called E. caniculi. And E. caniculi has been known to cause many different types of diseases, affect many different body systems, and really has been difficult to pinpoint how to diagnose and how to treat it. So E. caniculi is a microsporidial parasite that is actually a type of protozoa. However, we've actually found that many times it has a lot of resemblances in how it replicates and how it interacts with the body to some of the different types of fungi. And many rabbits across the country and across the world are found to have been exposed to this and never shown any clinical signs or never shown any disease associated with it. Now it doesn't mean that they've never been exposed and it also doesn't necessarily mean that they won't ever have a chance of developing that disease. But many of the types of diseases that we've seen it cause in rabbits specifically, we'll get into other species here in a minute, but we've seen many different things. Most common that we've seen in veterinary medicine is neurologic disease. And this can be everything from a head tilt to rolling to just really weird depression and lethargy, blindness, etc. It can be variable depending on what type of clinical signs we're seeing as to where it infected in the brain. However, other organ systems that have been known to be affected include the eyes, the heart, the kidneys, and the liver. And many of these other systems are affected in, inconsistently and have been difficult to prove that although the organism has been found there, it's hard to prove that it's actually causing the disease sometimes, especially before we can do post-mortem analysis or a necropsy, which is like an autopsy for animals. Now the biggest challenge with E. caniculi is that it is extremely hard to diagnose as a veterinarian. And the reason that it's so hard to diagnose is that one, just because you find it in the animal does not necessarily prove that that's the disease that's causing it. And so if we do go forward with treatment for it, oftentimes we have to go forward on a hunch. And unfortunately, a hunch is not always great in veterinary medicine or in any type of medicine, but sometimes it's all we have to go off of. Now, E. caniculi will oftentimes be found post-mortem in rabbits, in the brain, and in many different organs, and with variable degrees of inflammation. In rabbits that have been found to have died from neurologic disease or been so neurologic that euthanasia was elected, that sometimes they don't actually find the organism in the areas of the brain that seem to be affected based on the clinical signs. So there's a lot of inconsistency with this disease and there's a lot that's not yet understood as to why it causes the diseases that it does and the rabbits that it does and yet so many rabbits are just fine and never show any clinical signs. So it can be very hard to actually diagnose with an evidence-based approach. Oftentimes veterinarians have to go on a hunch of is this what we're actually treating or is it something else? So your vet goes ahead and says, this is what we're dealing with, or we think this might be what we're dealing with. What should they be doing next? What does a vet think about before they say, yes, this is E. caniculi? Well, the most important thing that they should be doing is ruling out other causes of this neurologic disease. Because if you have a rabbit that has neurologic disease, is, has a head tilt, is rolling, is having other vestibular signs, or is just generally depressed and lethargic, you really need to make sure that we're not dealing with something like an ear infection. If you wanna learn a little bit more about ear infections in rabbits, you can take a look up here. Now, ear infections in rabbits are surprisingly common and they can cause very similar symptoms to E. caniculi. 
Now the difference is that E. caniculi typically is going to cause what we call central vestibular symptoms, which means that it's associated directly with the brain and not with the peripheral vestibular system, which is the nerves that run in along the ears and along the cochlear nerve. So if a rabbit has a head tilt because of an ear infection, we're going to see slightly different symptoms than if we see a rabbit that has central vestibular system symptoms. However, the other thing is, is that sometimes, especially in rabbits, it can be hard to differentiate between central vestibular symptoms and peripheral vestibular symptoms. So if your veterinarian goes ahead and decides there's no ear infections, everything looks clear, and they're still having a head tilt or they're rolling or have a droopy ear, something along those lines that's neurologic in origin, they're oftentimes going to treat with a product called fenbendazole, uh, otherwise known as Panicure. And if you go look on many sites across the internet, this is going to be your most common treatment that's recommended by people in rabbit communities. And there is a good reason for this, and, but it's also not a good reason. So with this organism, E. caniculi, um, we found that in other organisms that are similar in people and in dogs and cats, treating with fenbendazole for a certain period of time can be curative or can decrease the amount of sporulation or replication of this organism in those tissues. And when we decrease the amount of replication, we're gonna decrease the inflammation and therefore the symptoms. So basically what I'm saying is that yes, this theoretically has a reason that we're using it. We're trying to use it to decrease how much this organism is replicating and causing inflammation. Because the two goals of treatment are going to be decreasing the amount of replication and decreasing the amount of inflammation. And so this helps with both. The other thing that your vet may or may not prescribe is some sort of anti-inflammatory. And this can be anything from a steroid like dexamethasone or prednisolone, or they may even do something like meloxicam uh, that's often used in rabbits and exotics. The one thing to keep in mind is that oftentimes none of these products are going to be labeled for rabbits because here in the US we don't have a lot of products that are actually labeled for rabbits or small mammals. We're doing a lot of things off-label, compounding, because we don't have another option for treatment. So if your vet does or doesn't do a steroid is not really that important, um, or a meloxicam, something along those lines. If rabbit is in pain or there is inflammation, I typically will recommend it for my patients, but your veterinarian may have a really good reason for not doing it. So keep that in mind. And just because they don't or choose a different treatment protocol than this, don't go after them and say, why didn't you do this? Um, you can ask their reasoning and oftentimes they'll be willing to discuss it with you. But this is how I usually would approach it. And one other quick clarification is that I'm not telling your vet or telling you how to tell your vet how to diagnose or treat this disease. And that's for a few reasons. One, legally I can't because I have not seen your animal. I cannot diagnose or prescribe for your animal. But the other thing is that your vet is very attuned once they do a physical exam of what they're seeing and what they're feeling. Now, you might want to bring up some things to your vet and say, hey, what about this? What about this? You know, and have that conversation and have that open dialogue so that one, your vet knows that you're engaged in understanding what they're telling you, but don't get caught in the trap of trying to tell your vet everything and not listening to what they have to say. And one of the things that I find in a lot of the rabbit communities and forums and all those things that I go through browsing is that rabbit medicine is a lot different than any other medicine. And I think that's a really big misconception in the rabbit community. Now, granted, there are going to be vets that are better and vets that are worse at dealing with rabbits. And that a lot of times has to do with experience you know, of what they've experienced and what they've dealt with in the past. However, the first thing you need to do to be a good rabbit vet is be a good veterinarian in general. Know your drugs, know the body, understand how cells and infections work and understand all of the basics. And then if you understand those things, 
rabbits are not that difficult or different. It just takes a little bit of reading and a little bit of looking up of what has, has and hasn't been done in the past. So keep that in mind as well, is that you, even though your vet may not have a lot of experience with rabbits, if they're willing to read, they may be a really good vet because a lot of this information about rabbit medicine has actually been translated over and um, sort of adapted from other species, whether it be cats, dogs, horses, small other small animals, things like that. So just keep that in mind. One other little thought here I wanted to mention too is that up to this point, there really have been no studies trying to show how effective any treatment is on E. caniculi. So everything that a vet does to treat this disease is going to be off-label and without a lot of evidence to treat it. Because as of right now, there just have not been the studies performed that are necessary in order to say, yes, this works or no, this doesn't. So with E. caniculi, how is it spread? Well, there's two modes of transmission or two modes or ways that it is spread. The first way is horizontal transmission, and this is a, a fancy term for basically passing it from one rabbit to another. If you have two cage mates, they'll pass it to each other through horizontal transmission. And typically this is through ingestion, eating urine or drinking urine, or having some contamination where they ingest hay that was urinated on, something along those lines as it seems to be that urine is the most common method of transmission. Although there have been a few studies that have shown that it can be transmitted through aerosol, so through the air and into the lungs and a couple other ways as well experimentally. The other way that it can be transmitted is vertically. And this is from basically going from mama rabbit to baby rabbit in utero. And it can be spread across the uterus and the placenta and oftentimes it'll have a specific type of E. caniculi where it will infect the eye uh, and you'll see the ocular form of E. caniculi. The last thing that I wanted to mention here before we end this video is that E. caniculi can also be spread to other animals and people. Now, although it's rare, it has been known to be seen in cats, dogs, um, a plethora of other animals, as well as in people. So. In people, I didn't do a lot of research into what types of disease it can cause, but I do know that it can cause neurologic disease in people. So this is a good reason to continue to wash your hands, especially if you're handling any fecal or urine material from these animals, and especially your bunnies. Not saying you can't snuggle them or you can't do this or that, but just try to be sanitary. Most of the time that it has been transmitted to people, those people have been severely immunocompromised. And so in healthy people with a normal immune system, it doesn't seem to be a very high risk, but I will say continue to wash your hands and just be clean. That's all I have to say about that. So if you guys have questions about this topic, make sure you leave them down below. I'm happy to answer questions. If you have specific questions about your rabbit, that's probably a better question for your vet, uh, but I can answer some just general questions down below. And on that note, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button, and we will see you guys in the next video.